Hello, everybody, and welcome to Sake Revolution. This is America's first sake podcast, and I am your host, John Puma from the Sake Notes, also the administrator over at the Internet Sake Discord. Please do come by occasionally and have a drink with us. And around these parts, I'm the local sake otaku, like you guys. Yes, and I am your host, Timothy Sullivan. I'm a sake samurai, sake educator, as well as the founder of the Urban Sake website. And every week, John and I will be here tasting and also chatting about all things sake, doing our best to make it fun and easy to understand. Mm, I do enjoy making things fun and easy to understand. <laughs> Well, let me ask you this, John. Have you ever seen any sake documentaries? I have potentially kickstarted a sake documentary. <laughs> Which one was that? The Birth of Sake. The Birth of Sake. Now, I think without a doubt, we can say that that is probably the most well known sake documentary. Yes, I'm going to say that is definitely the most well-known sake documentary. Yes, I was also a Kickstarter supporter. And when I'm out in the field and I'm teaching classes or talking to consumers about sake, almost like clockwork, you can guarantee someone's going to say, I saw this show on Netflix about, <laughs> and before they finish their sentence, I'm like, oh, the birth of sake. And they're like, yes, that's it. So... It is an amazing documentary. And before we go any further, we have to say, if you haven't seen The Birth of Sake, you have Full to... stop. Put, put this on pause. <laughs> <laughs> put this on pause. Pause your pause. podcast. Go watch the documentary and then come back. Run, don't walk. <laughs> <laughs> it's really an insight in and a lot of uh, visibility into the sake brewing process that at the time, especially, was really not available to anyone. Like it was like really unveiling like so much that's behind the scenes that that regular people don't see. Was that your impression? Yeah, I think so. Should we give a little summary of what the documentary was all about? I mean, sure, why not? Yeah. So I I know it was filmed from 2012 to 2014 at a sake brewery in Ishikawa. The director, mm -hmm. his name was Eric Shirai, a Japanese-American guy. And it was the first feature-length documentary that he uh, was the director of. So kind of a freshman effort for feature-length documentary. And it basically chronicled the brewing season at a small, family-run, old-school sake brewery. So really a disappearing art and a disappearing way of crafting sake was documented in this movie. It was really beautifully shot as well. Why are we talking about the birth of sake today? We're moving our eye to the brand talked about in that exact documentary. It was inevitable. Yes. We knew it was going to happen eventually <laughs> when we started doing brands. We're going to be doing Tedorigawa today. Tedorigawa, yes. So they are the subject brewery of this really, really well-known documentary, The Birth of Sake. And we couldn't mention one without the other. So we are focusing on a fantastic brand from Ishikawa, Te Dorigawa, as you said. Mm -hmm. and, and and we've taken some, some journeys to Ishikawa on the show before. <laughs> yes, we have. <laughs> yes. We visited with uh, Hannah Kirshner. Yes. When she was literally physically in Ishikawa. Mm-hmm. And I believe we've had some other run-ins. Yeah, I told early on, I told some stories about going to rural Ishikawa and getting dropped off in the middle of nowhere. Yes. And yes. And uh, if you look at a map of Japan, Ishikawa is really easy to locate because if you look on the west side of the island, there's this peninsula that juts out into the Sea of Japan. Mm -hmm. And that is basically where Ishikawa is located. And... The brand name is Tedorigawa, and this is named after a river. Uh, te means hand. You might have learned that in Japanese class, hand. Hi. Dori in this context means to hold, and gawa means river. 
So it literally translates to like hand holding river. And you're like, mm. what does that mean? Well, the owner and Toji of the brewery explained that before they had a bridge to cross the river, people would hold hands and make this like human chain to get across the river. So it's all about working together and community. And it's a really interesting name for the river mm-hmm. and for the brand. Nice. I see like you see like Gawa, which, yeah. which, as you pointed out, means river. You see a lot of sake brands and breweries. Uh, and and Todori comes up occasionally, yeah. but this is, to my knowledge, the only one that actually combines them. And that story that you told is like really interesting. Oh, it's about getting across this place together, and that yeah, that's important. Sake brewing is a team sport. Yeah, absolutely. And let's give a few more details about this brewery. So the brewery name is Yoshida Shuzoten. So the Yoshida family is the owners of the brewery, and the brewery's named after them. And this one dates back to 1870. So they just had their 150th anniversary. So that's pretty impressive in my book. Wow. So usually when we do breweries and we compare them to like American history, it's like, oh, the United States was just about being a thing at this point or something like that. But in this case, we're kind of a little more like flirting with civil war. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's still impressive. 150 years. 150 and, years. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. Really amazing. So the current president is Yasuyuki Yoshida. And he's in his mid thirties now. And mm. he's the seventh generation president of the brewery. And not only is he, the president, but he's also the toji or the master brewer. And Mm. it's really interesting because one of the premises of the Birth of Sake documentary was Yasu training to become the toji. And the previous toji, he was 65 or so, ready to retire. And he wanted to pass on his knowledge as a master brewer to the to the next generation so yasu became the next president but he also took on the role of being the master brewer so you see that in the documentary that he's right. learning from the master learning from his elder and what they have now is kind of the end result of what happened in the documentary. So it's really cool to see that. That is unusual. I want to say in the sake world where you take on both roles. I mean, we've, we've had maybe an unusual number of uh, situations where brothers have taken over the brewery Mm. and split those duties. One being Kurumoto, one being the Toji. Right. Uh, And in this case, you have one person that's really taking on the full load. And do you, do do you find, uh, you know, apart from this example here, that this is something that does occur a little bit more commonly than we used to seeing, or is this really unusual? Well, it's happening more and more. And one mm. of the reasons for that is that there's fewer Toji's that are out there. They're getting <laughs> oh, no. older and older and retiring. So as there's fewer young people getting in the trade and becoming brewers, there's not as many Toji's to go around. So more and more Kuramoto or the brewery presidents are also taking on the role of kind of production manager and managing the brewery as well. So it is not common. It's not the usual way of things, but you are seeing it more and more. And what we have here at Yoshida Shuzoten is a classic example of the younger generation stepping up and taking on these responsibilities and again, breathing in new life to their brand and their brewery. And it's really exciting. The other thing about this region, we said it was in Ishikawa. And the place where I visited before was the Noto Peninsula. That's where I got dropped off in the middle of nowhere. Yes, and that's a, the famous sake revolution tale of your being dropped off in the middle <laughs> yes. of nowhere. And this area of Ishikawa is called Hakusan. Hakusan. Hakusan, and it literally translates to White Mountain. It's the highest mountain 
in this region. And the water source for their Teidori Gawasake comes from Hakusan Mountain, but it is filtered for many, many, many years. So they use underground water and it has a different profile. It is more mineral rich and it's harder water that they use at this brewery. And we're going to talk about that more when we taste their sake, what impact that has. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice. So, Tim, I'm going to ask you the really depressing question that I ask you every time we do one of these episodes. <laughs> and I'm, and I want you to take a moment and admire how long it took me to get to this. <laughs> but have you, have you visited this brewery? Yes. I have visited this brewery three times. What? Yes. <laughs> You're just rubbing it in now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I visited Ishikawa several times on some mm-hmm. of my brewery trips, and they are very centrally located and um, very welcoming. And so I had, I had the good fortune to visit a few times, and uh, they are just such a lovely family. And Yasu, who is the, the current president, he has such a passion for bringing this new energy to his brewery. They want to support the local rice farmers in Ishikawa. They have dedicated themselves to purchase 75% of all the rice they use to come from Ishikawa to support the rice farmers in their prefecture. And that's a program they started a few years ago to increase the amount of rice that they buy locally to support those farmers. I thought that was awesome, too. That is great. And and I think, like generally speaking, we're pretty big fans of when breweries make use of a local rice and the, the materials that go into making sake. That's really great. I'm excited to taste some <laughs> sake from Tedorigawa and uh, as as is customary and traditional and the way we do things on this show, we will be tasting a sake from Tedorigawa. We both have the same sake tonight, which I think is a lot of fun. We like to focus on having the same stuff so we can really compare notes in a real way. And it is the Tedorigawa Yamaha Daiginjo. And in the U S we call this the chrysanthemum meadow. I really like this name, but even more, it's so unusual to have a Yamaha Daiginjo. Yes. Very unusual. Yeah. And yeah. like this is Daiginjo, not Junmai Daiginjo. So right. this is the alcohol added method, the ten. So the Daiginjo part of this Yamaha Daiginjo, Daiginjo is a super premium grade That means the rice is polished down to 50% remaining or less. And normally, daiginjos are fruity, super rich, extremely aromatic. And this one is a Yamahai-style daiginjo, which is really unusual. So Yamahai is our fermentation starter that allows for lactic acid to build up naturally. And... Teidorigawa is a huge proponent of Yamaha. They are one of the big players in that field. They are. They are just super big fans of Yamaha at this brewery. So we are going to be the beneficiaries of this marriage between the full flavors of Yamaha and the elegance of Dai Ginjo. So that's mm-hmm. what we are setting ourselves up for. And I, I am, I've had this sake before, but not in a long time. So I am really excited to revisit these flavors and explore this marriage between these two usually very different styles of brewing. Yeah. So it's been a while for me as well. Uh, I'm going to go into the uh, specifics on it Mm -hmm. for a moment. Yeah. So in this case, the rice variety is more than one. They're using Mm -hmm. Yamada Nishiki and Gohyaku Mangoku to make this. And I assume, uh, I don't have the exact information in front of me that the Yamada Nishiki is probably being used for the Koji Mai for the, for the Koji portion of it. And Mm -hmm. then Gohyaku Magoku most likely being used for the, the starch component. Yep. And the Gohyaku Magoku, I'm pretty sure given that 75% commitment they have is probably 
grown in Ishikawa for sure. Yeah. Um, the polishing rate on these, oh, is 45%. So this is mm. sternly in Daiginjo territory. <laughs> yes. um, the sake meter value, that, that measure of your your dry to your sweet is plus five. So this is definitely going to be leaning a bit on the dry side. And the alcohol percentage, 15 to 16, and the acidity mm -hmm. at 1.2. So mm -hmm. low acid, high polish, and a little bit on the dry side. Yeah. And again, a Yamaha. Yes. Tends to be a little bit more earthy. And a Daiginjo tends to be a little bit more uh, uh, elegant. So this is going to yeah. be a really interesting sake to taste. Yeah. Well, with that out of the way, let's get it open and into the glass. Well, yes, let's. So before I even talk about the complexion of this sake, when I opened up the bottle and started pouring that aroma, mm. I know it's a lot of order, but Tim, let's talk about this aroma. Yes. <laughs> well, what, what hits you first? <laughs> what hit me first is that is there was a, a, like a, a really refreshing note that came out that almost made me double check and be like, wait a minute, is this a Nama? Obviously it's not, mm. but it had this really, really refreshing outdoors in spring kind of aroma to it. Irish spring. No, no, <laughs> no. outdoors uh, morning outdoors in spring. Mm. Well, for me, I, I totally pick up on what you're saying, but I also get a, a note of something a little bit honeyed, like a little think of honey and mm -hmm. that kind of, sweet uh there's there's a sweet characteristic to the aroma a little bit of a honey aroma as well mm. that there is, mm. is there is a sweetness and yeah uh i don't know if you just put the thought of honey in my mind but i think i did i think i did and i and i think that that's a thing we, we've talked about this before on the show mm. that when you're discussing flavors and aromas of people that sometimes having that conversation and like mm. helping figure out like how to put the words into what you're what you're smelling mm. or tasting is 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 really good it helps you kind of like develop your vocabulary and like mm -hmm. understand better like what you're experiencing and so yeah i get that a little bit that honeyness yeah but now let's talk about the complexion so this is uh pretty clear mm -hmm. i want to say it's a very 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 slightly yellowed would mm -hmm. you agree yep absolutely yeah. Yeah, it has just just a hint of a golden cast to it. Yeah, just just yeah. just a whisper of that, but it's perfectly transparent and seems to have a nice viscosity. I'm seeing some legs on the side of my glass. Ooh, I don't know if we've and, ever mentioned that on the show before. The legs on the side of the glass. Yeah. So, well, that's you know, I think most people know that from the wine world as well. When you swirl wine in a glass and then you have the drips coming down the side, those are called mm -hmm. the legs and uh, if they are wider and move a little more slowly, you can infer that that is more viscosity or more thickness to the sake or the wine. And if they move very th fast and if they're very thin or water-like, then that is a lower viscosity, less thickness. Yeah, this is definitely uh, sticking to the side right. of this glass as I yep. swirl it around a little bit. Yeah, you can see those legs or those tears coming down very, very uh, distinctly forming. Yeah. All right. Let's give it a taste. Huh. Okay. We have to say right now, this is not your average Daiginjo. No. <laughs> it's also not your average Yamaha. <laughs> right. <laughs> you got your chocolate in my peanut butter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that is a really great way to put that. <laughs> If you look at the stats for this, 45% rice milling, SMV mm. plus five, Yamada Nishiki and Gohyaku Mangoku rices, low acidity, you could just assume, if you didn't know it wasn't about the Yamaha part of it, 
you could just assume, oh, this is going to be a really luscious, fruity, daiginjo, like very aromatic. And this is not that. No, this, not at all. I, I don't know if you'd agree with me, John, but this almost has an herbal note to it. Not Slightly. grassy, but yeah, a little bit for me, a little bit of a honey note, a little bit of an herbal note. Uh, very smooth, very silky on the palate. The texture, the daiginjo texture is there, 110%. Yeah, it's it's interesting because doing the flavors that you often get from Yamaha, although not as not as intensely, not as funky mm. uh, as your funkier Yamahais, but just doing it with the the texture of your daiginjo and like that that smoothness that you expect. It's such an interesting. Uh, combination and as you alluded to earlier when you mentioned the chocolate in my peanut butter joke uh, to a lot of people out there who um, may not be as old as Tim and I um, (laughs) (laughs) Reese's peanut butter cups used to do these commercials where they would make jokes about like accidentally combining peanut butter and chocolate and finding out that they're amazing together and (laughs) that's kind of what we're seeing here is that this is like these two styles of sake that you would think intrinsically would be polar opposites are really, really going together here. Yes. Yes. I'm just glad you're old enough to get my joke, John. Oh, well, you know, I'm not no <laughs> spring chicken myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I completely agree with you. It's such an interesting marriage. And mm-hmm. I think it shows this really speaks to this brewery, Teidori Gawa, this brand's dedication to Yamaha that they would even do this. These two do go really well together. And it, it may not completely please the diehard Yamaha fan who's expecting mm. that really big, earthy, mushroomy flavor from his Yamaha. But it also may not immediately please the person, I think you, you alluded to this earlier, who's looking for fruit and mm. looking for that 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 really fruity, silky, you know, Daiginjo journey. Yeah, it's doing a little bit of both and it's making a new thing. It's making something Mm. completely different from either one. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it also makes it very food friendly as well. Like Mm -hmm. Yamaha is known as being very food friendly. Daiginjo, not as much because it tends to be so (laughs) aromatic and fruity usually. And but this really brings, I find the great aspects of both of those styles of sake together and really opens up food pairing possibilities too. It lends a touch of earthiness to Daiginjo that you don't usually see. That's kind of what I would say is shorthand, right? Right. I'd say it opens up Yamaha for Daiginjo drinkers (laughs) who, you know, people who really want that elegant style and maybe don't know about Yamaha. Right. Or maybe I never had it before. And then they have this, it's like really nice bridge into it. Mm. Um, to be completely honest, when I first had this sake, I really wasn't that familiar with Yamaha, and it yeah. really opened my eyes to that concept. And like, oh, wait a minute, there's this other style out there. Mm. And while it's not my favorite style of sake, I appreciate it, and I'm glad it's there. And this kind of let me know to look for it and like try other stuff and 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 really learn to appreciate Yamaha. Yeah, this is a really interesting sake to taste especially if you're starting to learn about different classifications and grades and styles of sake having some of these genre benders genre benders <laughs> yes <laughs> having some of these styles is a great way to educate your palate too yeah. and when you know what yamaha means and you know what daiginjo means and you taste the sake consciously and you really pay attention while you're tasting it you can get a lot of insight into what each style brings to the party and how that influences the flavor. So it's a great learning opportunity too. Again, I'm super glad they did this because it is, it's a great sake. Like it is, Mm. this is an amazing, interesting sake to taste. It's a, it is a Daiginjo that you can have and pair with amazing foods. Like there's so much Mm -hmm. going on here and it's not something that you get unless they went and took this step. Yeah. This is a sake that is definitely unique, right? Yeah. It's not a flavor you'd get usually. So it's stepping outside of the standard profile for these sakes and it's, it's really unique, but it's very, very delicious. 
that it's got a richness to it that I really, really like. Yeah. Just a nice, rich, honeyed, a little bit of herbaceousness and um, some weight. But again, they come in with that daiginjo texture, like that silky smooth texture. It just makes it so enjoyable to drink. Really good. Yeah. So we've tasted this wonderful Te Dorigawa Sake. And one thing that brings me back to the documentary, The Birth of Sake, what they do at Yoshida Shuzoten, what they do at this brewery, is they have an older school style of brewing, not just Yamaha, but they also have the brewers live at the brewery. Now, most breweries don't do this anymore. But as you saw in the documentary, the team of six or seven brewers, they are there from October through the springtime. They live together. They get up at 4.30 in the morning. (laughs) These guys are carrying the whole burden of sake production on their shoulders, and they work as a team under the leadership of the toji. And what I think is so interesting is that they have this super classic, traditional, really old-fashioned style of work at their brewery. But this sake they've made is so cutting edge in a way. It's like so out there, unique, different, delicious, but not, you'd think uh, brewing in that style, but they're making something really modern and delicious and unique. Yeah, I I think that that often results in a good product when you take the 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 old and the classic and then you you put your own spin on it and you modernize it you're not disregarding the classic you're bringing it up to date and you're you're doing something new and interesting with it and i think that that more often than not really works Mm -hmm. do you agree yeah and it's about respecting tradition but not being bound by it right like that is a great way to put it i love i love the way you phrase that yeah so yasu yoshida the, the new young president and Toji, I think he's coming up with ways to fold in new traditions, new ways of doing things, but really respecting the past. And they just had a big celebration of 150 years last year. Wow. And um, taking a look back, they have a video on their website, which I'll put in our show notes, that kind of walks you through all the different presidents of the brewery and shows you some pictures from their archives. So they obviously have a great respect for their past and their history. And what they're doing now is also really exciting. So if you haven't seen it, definitely go out and watch The Birth of Sake. You can see Yasu Yoshida, this new Kuramoto, when he was in training to become the Toji, which he is now. You can see all the struggles he went through and all the hard work that goes into making these sakes. It's really, really fantastic. And I also want to mention briefly that the Birth of Sake documentary won an award at the 2015 Tribeca Film Festival. It won the Best Documentary Director, and they got a special jury mention for that. And in 2017, they won the James Beard Foundation Broadcast Media Documentary Award. So it's been well-received, and uh, it's a few years old now, but I think you can still get it on Apple TV and um, a few other places. So please uh, Google it and definitely check it out if you can. I I love their sake documentaries out there, don't you? (laughs) I'm happy there are. We need more. I I, I agree with you 100%. (laughs) Yes. Maybe we'll do one one day. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well... I want to thank all of our listeners so much for tuning in. We really do hope that you're enjoying Sake Revolution. If you would like to show your support for this podcast, please consider backing us on Patreon. We're a listener-supported show, and all the monies that are donated go to help us in the production of this show. Editing, website, hosting, all the different costs that you have for creating a podcast, Those Patreon donations really help us make this happen. That's right. Uh, This is a labor of love. And we do appreciate everybody who listens to our show. You guys are helping us getting uh, reviews up on your podcast platform of choice. 
all that really helps to just sending good vibes our way. We like that. And really, we notice. We do. We really do notice that. And we really do appreciate it. And if you would like to learn more about any of the topics, breweries, or sakes that we profiled in today's episode, be sure to visit our website, sakerevolution.com, and there you can check out all the detailed show notes. And if you have sake questions, I think we know some people you could send them to. That address is feedback at sakerevolution.com. So, until next time, please raise a glass, remember to keep drinking sake, and come by!